And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildred, and with me I have not one but two newcomers to the table. The double-headed monster that is the, that is the purveyors of Saturday Night Gaming, from the imagination to the table, now to the temple, and creators of Heavenscape, the one and only Scott Hibbard, and, and Tony Stevens. How are you guys doing today? Or tonight? Ah, doing great, man. Nice to be here. I'm ready to worship. <laughs> <laughs> um, the <laughs> so <laughs> God. God. damn it. Um You know I was holding myself back. I could have I could have gone with I could have gone with a NASCAR joke and I decided not to. <laughs> That's respectable. <laughs> um for, for one, I'm for one, I'm pretty sure being at the table would be another thing for Kyle Butch to whine about to whine about. <laughs> yes, see, yes. Even though I'm from Minnesota, I have, I have to, I have learned to in the art of shit posting on every sport. <laughs> you get, <laughs> gotta watch just enough so you can talk some smack, right? Um. Well, th well, that e that end. Um, there's a f there's a few people I follow. One of whom did a um alignment chart on the nine types of NASCAR winners. Uh, and. Wow. Would you like to take a guess as to who got chaotic evil? Uh, I don't even know if I can. Dale Earnhardt. No, that, yep. is that T-shirt. <laughs> oh, okay, good. Yay. Dale, Go Dale Sr. got chaotic evil. <laughs> wow. That was a good uh, guess. Even when I try not to win, I'm a winner. That's awesome. <laughs> All you do is win. Yeah. Um, so it's a bit of a tradition to open with the humble beginnings, as it were. And with that in mind... I'd like you to walk me through your your respective introductions to role playing games and what was it that made it stick? Sure, I'll start here. Scott here. Um, what I first started with was actually a Dungeons and Dragons uh, three point five uh, mm -hmm. back in high school, and uh, man, what really made it stick was the fact that you could come up with this fantasy world and these characters and this story, and you can actually you know play these characters and go on these quests and do these things, kind of like you could in a, in a video game. But there was so much more freedom with it. You weren't limited by code, you know. You had a GM, or DM in that case, and all you had to do was just convince them that, hey, this is a good idea. <laughs> Use logic. That's the hardest thing to do. Uh, yeah, he's he's been doing this for a real long time. I actually spent most of my life as a drunken Marine, uh, and then I came home and my cousin, uh, he brought me over to Scott's house for the first time. And he said, just give it a chance. You'll like it. And so I started playing a game with him. Um, and uh, you know what? I really did. I, I got carried away. I got really attached to it. Uh, he said, you can even do voices if you want to. And I was like, whoa, what do you mean? I can do voices. Oh, it's on like Donkey Kong now. <laughs> And so I went through an entire game just as Christopher Walken, just for the hell of it. And uh, I've been I've been pretty stuck on it since. And uh, it's just a, it's a great way to to meet and organize people and to have a, a different kind of community. I guess it's a, it's a wild ride and it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, and as far. As far as as far as as far as drunken marine as far as drunken marine um, things go, well, I hate I I will state for the record that given given some given some of the people I've had in the temple, um, you're in good company. Is <laughs> one of the recur <laughs> one of the recurring guests that I've had over the years is at, um, was Army, and I've had another I've had another guy who does a bit more old school material who was air force so um all i'm missing is marines and then I'll, not not marines and um all i'm missing is navy and then i'll have a full set yeah well i can find you one there's the coast guard too but we don't actually accept them either so it's okay <laughs> um <laughs> i was you know, i was always really under the impression that the coast guard was the red-headed stepchild 
Uh, yeah, we beat them as often as we can. Uh, if we can find them, yeah. they're usually taking a nap um, somewhere. Well, <laughs> that and that and one guy, I, that and one guy I've I've had I've had on the past who um had the unfortunate luck of of having to spend time in Fort Polk. Ooh. Which <laughs> yeah, um, I've heard I was I've, stationed out in sunny San Diego the whole time. Uh, I suppose I suppose it could have been worse. You could have been the stumps. As as I've heard oh, it yeah. called, um, I know the official name is I think Twenty Nine Palms, but everyone I've asked always calls it the Stumps. You are correct, sir. You are nailing it right now. Uh, yeah, I was a while north of them, but uh, yeah, I was stationed at Miramar. It was an air station, had beautiful planes every single day. Uh, stationed right there underneath the uh, my my office was actually outside of the tower that. Tom Cruise flies the plane past mm -hmm. in the movie Top Gun. Yeah, um, but when it comes to when it comes to he when it comes to Heavenscape, now one of the thing one of the vibes that I got after from reading the Kickstarter page was that this was something that kind of started because you guys were shifting between jo between genres as you as you guys were playing. And converting converting characters from one genre or another or, or one game to another um, became more and more tricky. So this was the way out. Is that accurate? Yeah. Um, when we first started Heavenscape, um, we kind of just had this idea of doing like an ongoing uh, adventure through multiple campaigns mm -hmm. and we had the idea of kind of using a single system to do it that it kind of keeps things uh, simple you know you can move mm -hmm. from one campaign to another using the same system uh the problem we ran into was uh no system we found could really hold for what we were wanting to do so uh when we realized that and uh, we looked around we couldn't find anything we figured hey we just uh just make our own do it ourselves yeah there's a lot of people that uh we got on to different chat boards and stuff and said look this is this is what we're looking for we're looking for something that we can grow characters for make them legacy characters throughout campaigns keep them growing the same way you would if you wanted to transition uh you know a playing character from one game to another i guess if you had like a wow character that you had built out and maxed out you wanted to keep them you keep playing with them um, but everybody was like, good luck with that. That's not how it works. And, you know, I got a lot of negative feedback when I put out there for it. And, uh, we just wanted something that, you know, the story could go on the, the epicness of it doesn't have to stop just because one game ended. Um, that story was told, but these characters can keep going and people get really attached to their characters, uh, in these things so much so that they'll freak out if you kill their character, you know? So, uh, mm -hmm. It was just one of those things. I wanted to see this kind of blossom into uh, a whole universe, a multiverse, mm -hmm. really. Yeah, which is definitely some definitely something I can get into. And um, universal style games are the are the ide are the ideal um, to work with with that. Now, when it comes now, it talks about it talks about. Um, Using a set using um, each die from D four through D one hundred, but it's so but it sounds like the D one hundred is the focus. And when I looked at the character sheet, the vibe that I ended up getting was that of um, War of uh, Warhammer Fantasy. Was that the impetus for going with a percentile die approach? Well, we. Went with a percentile uh, approach because we wanted these characters to be able to, uh, I guess, grow organically um, and over time. Uh, this this game is is not built for a uh, you know quick go from level one to twenty type deal in like you know six months. <laughs> you know, uh, this is a built for a yeah. It's going to take you fifty something sessions, and then hey, maybe you'll finally get one of your skills up there to maxed out. But hey, you've got others you got to work on now too. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely designed for the long haul for people who like to get together a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of these the people that have out there that I've met have one specific group that they like to play with a lot. That's their friends. That's their core group. Um, so it's it's definitely designed to help them 
continue telling a story the, the same way that you know if you're playing dungeons and dragons uh what what are they on fifth edition now or something yeah uh you know if you're playing that you're going to be going for a while one one battle could take you five hours to tell the story of uh so th this is in that same vein where it is something designed a little bit more narrative driven but it's designed to help you create those stories with each other for a long period period of time and really invest yourself in whatever character you have and, you know, to connect with each other in that way um, and have those great stories. So that if you're at a party the other, you know, some other night and you're like, Hey man, remember that time we went right into that thing? Oh, ha ha ha. You know, but they'll tell it almost like it's a, uh, it's a memory that they shared. And uh, I think that that's the, the great part about it is that it can become its own living, breathing, organic part of your your weekly uh, hangout. And when it comes now, when it comes to when it comes to the um, when it comes to that die set that die setup of you mm -hmm. of using um, now, as I understand it, you're because of the fact that you're aiming for percentile. Um, with the D100, you're aiming for a shoot low um, approach. Um, a lot of times, when there's a kind when there's a kind of shoot low, the approach that they have is that um, 100s are an automatic fail, and um, a one is an automatic success. Um, mm -hmm. Or in so, or in some cases, like like <laughs> say eclipse phase, success um, criticals and botches are determined by rolling doubles. Um, do you guys have a similar approach or are you skewing a bit differently? Um, we have a similar approach to it. Um, you're correct with that roll low. So basically the lower you get, the better off you are, but mm -hmm. we have basically four tiers. All right. We've got the, uh, the first tier is the, the exceptional success. That's if you roll really low, you know, like the zero through five. All right. Whatever you're going for, you exceptionally succeeded at. So you might even get like a little bonus perk off of it because you did so well. Okay. Uh, if you just roll under, you know, you succeeded at what you're doing, you know, with no consequence. All right. So if you're trying, you know, jump a 10 foot gap, well, you made it free and clear. Okay. But uh, if you roll high, then uh, you may have made it, but maybe you slipped and now you're on the edge. And now you have to make another roll. See if you even fall or even pull yourself back up. Maybe you need some help from an ally. Maybe hold on for your dear life, you know. So, we the last one is uh, obviously the what we call hard fail, mm -hmm. and that's when you just completely just botch the effort altogether. So, in this scenario of jumping a ten foot gap, you completely missed. And uh, if your party's equipped, they may be able to save you. <laughs> maybe, maybe <laughs> depends. Those are when it gets really fun, though. Um, the way you describe that, is it a case of degrees of success? Yes, and uh, we didn't want it to be a strictly pass-fail uh, type thing. We wanted to, like, if you didn't fully succeed on what you're attempting, that you may get a partial success out of it, and that's when you roll high. Unless, of course, you just do a hard fail, then that's like a complete, utter failure. Yeah, which I can definitely get. Um when it comes to when it comes to degrees of when it comes to degrees of success, the obviously one of the big one that com that comes to mind is like I mentioned before with Warhammer Fantasy, where a degree of success is every ten points you roll under um, the given percent that you were mm -hmm. supposed to shoot for. Um, do you have a system similar to that, or are you guys going with um, fi with fives or fifteens or a different number? No, actually, we just had a, just a four tier set up just like that. So, uh, I mean, as long as you roll under, you're pretty good. If you hit that zero through five, you know, that's the exceptional. That's where you get that bonus out of it. Mm -hmm. um, if you roll high, then that's what we call a soft fail. Um, unless, of course, you hit that, uh, you know, 96, 96 to 100. 100. Yeah. And that's it's most of that, too. I, w the way I look at it is that it helps, uh, you know, because Scott's the mechanic monkey. He's he's here because he understands that stuff like the back of his hand. Uh, most of those games, he gets it. Um, he explains it to me most of the time over and over again until I start my brain grasps it. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the times the big push that I always try to push into these things is 
it's a story. It's a narrative. And so it's got to be intriguing. It's got to be something that you want to have to tell. And the, the tier system helps with that. So it's not just, hey, you succeeded or hey, you failed. It's, it's oh, man, you did so well. You're, you're doing cartwheels over everybody else or something to that d- degree. Whereas the, the failures is, you know, you, yeah, you failed, but you got by, you lived. No, you epically failed. You're you're probably going to die soon. Like mm-hmm. this is this isn't going going well for you. But it helps to gauge that, especially as a GM, when you're trying to captivate a room. You know, I'm usually dealing with what we're dealing with, like five to eight people at a time in each of our games. He'll be running one. I'll be running one. Um, Wait, that's are you a doing lot eight of people. people at once? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah we have a group of uh, what are we at now? Sixteen. Twenty. Twenty. Yeah. So we have to divide the group up into three games. Uh, normally, we'll have somebody doing a just a fun fan fiction kind of side questy thing that they can mm-hmm. do, and then we'll split the two main parties into two campaigns um, for a long time. Especially when we were first building uh, the Heavenscape mechanics, he was running uh, what what most of the Kickstarter is based off of right now, the Exordia campaign. And I was running one called the Dawn, the Dawn of the Dark Star, mm-hmm. um, but we were running that at the same time. And I think he had you had six or seven, mm-hmm. and I had about seven myself. Yep. Um, so yeah, you you want to keep that many people entertained and invested in it. You have to really get wild with the storytelling, and that I think the mechanics that we've put into this have helped that because as a GM, that's the hard part trying to get that that flow. Mm-hmm of you're telling a story but you're also mediating the rules and you're presenting a world to these people um and to get that many people invested at the same time it takes it takes some good mechanics behind the scenes to really influence how that story gets told yeah now um obviously the um when it can't now you guys have talked about doing a doing a multiverse, um, mm-hmm. and the obviously the um, co- the core high fantasy setting that you guys have is um, Gorsham. Was when this w- when this was inig- originally being done, was it a case where Gorsham was kind of the setting that you guys started out with, and then it just kind of expanded out from there? <laughs> no, 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 at all. <laughs> yeah, that was. Uh... I mean, I think when we first started discussing it, because uh, what honestly would happen was, we, I think it was last year, yep. we were sitting there and we ran a six-month campaign based out of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And after a while, I, I came to Scott and I said, look, like, this is great. This is fun. I love Marvel. I love, the, I love presenting these games to people. But we have nothing that we can really hold on to for ourselves. This isn't, you know, we didn't, we've got to... If we even broadcast this, this is Marvel's rights. Every, everything is. I said, but I think that we have enough creative people here that we could really create something of our own. Um, and that's really, and he said, well, I had this old idea called Heavenscape. And then it just kind of spawned from there because for me growing up, when I read Marvel comics growing up, and I read some DC and Image comics as well, but people would always ask me, who's your favorite character? And that baffled me because they all are. It's a multiverse. It's this sprawling universe. That's, that's my favorite character of it. And so when we started chiseling this out of nothing, uh, the big thing that I thought that we both agreed on was that this is a multiverse right off the bat. You're creating this world over here. I'm going to create this world over here with the knowledge that there are multiple tiers of existence that we're going to be dealing with at different points during the narration. Yeah. And when it comes that, that, um, that does bring me, that does bring me to, um, some, some of the nitty gritty of things, but the, now the main thing that I'm, the main thing that I'm curious about is, in regard is in regard to skills. I'll start. I'll start simple. Now, I'm just go. I'm just going off of the character sheet right now. But would it be fair of me to say that when when roll when when doing a when doing a percentile roll, it's usually based on an attribute. 
and the skill um, increases the increases the percent the um, that attribute percentage. Would that, i.e., the um, attribute is ten or twenty or so high, or so higher than what it actually is? Would that be accurate? Uh, it's actually it's pretty close. Um, what we have the, with our attributes um, kind of set up the way they are. They they basically cover groups. Mm -hmm. um, like for instance, you have uh, the strength there, um, which would cover any skill that's uh, strength related or could be used strength related. Mm -hmm. um, it gives basically a kind of a bonus. You know, it's a fairy uh, rank into it. it's uh, like a minus one on your roll basically. You know, uh, that's what it does. Um, and of course, we have those where they they max out at ten. Uh, but essentially, that that's kind of the concept. They cover groups of skills, mm -hmm. so it's not particularly one specific skill attaches itself to, uh, attaches to a group. And uh, the luck one is really neat because that allows you to customize your character a little more. It lets you pick a group that's not already covered, and so you are particularly skilled at this group, just out of luck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's it. A lot of the skill tree is there to, for an individual to put, a, I, I, I would say, like a flavor on it. Uh, you know, if, if I've really focused on uh, my guy's a swordsman, right? You know, he's he's great with blades. So I've put a lot of effort into ranking up that skill with blades. Now, what I do with it as far as attributes are concerned, how I can logically explain some of those things. And the luck one actually came in handy um, in one of the last games that we did. One of our players actually maxed out his luck and was using a, a type of skill. How would you put it? I mean, it was like if it could happen, it was going to oh, happen. Probability. Probability fields. And so the luck factor really played in for him. So each time he did it, and it, it all mattered how he built his sheet out, of course, because, you know, that skill, that probability manipulation was going to be the, the rank in that skill. So, like, say he maxed it out to a 60 just starting out or went above that each time he got some ranking points. And then, well, of course, he had luck just maxed out. So if he rolled under what that skill rank was, there's his success right there. You know, that's that's what he's looking for. Now, of course, the the actual attributes play into that as well, but that's the main thing you're looking at, that skill tree as you're building it. That's what's really going to help you not only succeed, but flavor in how you're doing this and what your character is and how they're built, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that, in that regard, now, a lot of, a lot of times when I've seen D100 based games, they'll, you, they'll use not necessarily a class system, but in, but an archetype based, um, setup, or sometimes you have th things like careers. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. is origin going to be similar to that or is origin akin to race and or ethnicity? Now, origin is, uh, it's kind of like a mixture, basically. It's, um, we used, to, in our first concept of it, we had a uh, species and we had path, um, which, you know, path is kind of similar to your class. And we decided that we wanted to keep it, again, more, more narrative and more open. We didn't want to restrict people that, oh, just because I chose this species, these are my options, you know? So we came up with the idea of the origin, which is kind of a mixture of the two. Um, so your origin, uh, to give an example... Uh, we could use, let's say, agent. You know, um, that one is more of your uh, your spy type, you know, character. So that person has ties to where he's gathering intelligence, like an intelligence officer. You know, and that's just that kind of an origin. So it doesn't matter what what species he is or whatnot. Um, that's just his background as far as uh, how he's skilled. And of course, he gets certain bonuses based on that uh, to start out with. Right. His, his entire life has been spent acquiring certain skills uh, <laughs> to do one specific thing. And it, it is an archetype to a degree, uh, but Origin really does funnel it down more to, because uh, we had people who were saying, well, because we had a whole list of species that we were presenting to mm -hmm. people and what perks they could get out of choosing that species. And a lot of it, 
what you find, I guess what we found is people get kind of pigeon held in that one little idea. And they're like, but what if I want to be this from here? It just made it a lot easier to say, okay, what type of thing are you? Where are you coming from? Are you a soldier? Are you a healer? Are you, a, you know, and that's, that's where it got just easier to say, this is the type of character I'm playing. Now the rest is up to a narration and you'd be a, I mean, I'm always amazed at some of the backstories and things that people come up with when they have a little bit less constraint on uh, what they're doing. Yeah. And with that, with that in mind, I know you, I know you mentioned agent, but what would be a few, what would be a few other examples of um, origins in a, in, in the high fantasy end of things and, sure. and, um, in, when giving these examples, I, I'm also curious about what exactly one gets from an origin, because I'm curious if it's a case yeah. of this is what you can do or this is what you're better at. Yeah, sure. I can give you a couple of them. <clears throat> one of our actually <laughs> most picked is what we call the magician. And this is a basically magic centered uh, origin. Mm -hmm. All right. So in this particular case with a magician, um, they get to have increased spell damage. Uh, they also get bonus ranks and a spell casting skill of their choice. And then they also get to choose between four different uh, exploits to, you know, pick from for free that, you know, at character, creation. At character creation. And then they get a specific um, exploit that's specific to the origin, um, which is in this case, it's called arcane focus, which it makes it easier for them to learn new schools of magic pretty much. Um, and so that's the kind of example background of a mage type character. So to kind of compare that, you know, we do have like the uh, what we call the soldier origin. And this one, similar to the mage, you deal more damage with uh, weapons, you know, manufactured weapons. OK, so whether it's a sword, axe or whatnot, you're just really good with it. Mm -hmm. um, and just you also get ranks into your weapon skill of your choice. You know, so what's you know, weapon do you favor pretty much? And then, of course, you get to choose between three different exploits as well, based upon what kind of soldier you are. There's like an archer one where you do more damage with bows. There's one you do more damage with swords, you know, or melee weapons. It just really depends on kind of what flavor you're going with. And then, of course, it has a special exploit for itself as well, uh, which is called tactical. So it gives you the ability to uh, test a tactic skill in order to give you uh, certain advantages in combat. Mm -hmm. So... You know, to give example of two different ones there, you can see how they're similar to each other, but at the same time, they're also unique to itself. Yeah, it's almost like if you, if you pop in Skyrim and you start playing that, you're going to have a certain type of character you're going for. And then the skill tree, leveling up your skill tree through that uh, gameplay, that's, that's almost the feel I get from this in the sense of a tabletop way. But that's, in my mind, that's what I can kind of picture is like, I've got this guy... I know who he is as he's riding into the village before the storm cloaks or the empire is trying to take him away. Mm. Uh, now what he tries to evolve out of that, where he, if he's going to the brotherhood or if he's going somewhere else, that's, that's kind of the, the way that my mind thinks of it as the players play through their narr their narratives and they start leveling up certain skills. That's like that skill tree. It's uh, what are you focusing on? Your heavy armor, your light armor, uh, are you are you d devoting yourself entirely to sword play or are you going to be playing with a battle axe? You know, a lot of that stuff uh, comes in handy here. And just like in that, if you modded it out and played it through, uh, you're going to have certain perks to picking certain classes. And so I think that's what we've tried to do with several different classes. And we've got some of the more classic cliche type. Uh, we've got some that we've tried to modify to fit what we see people leaning towards more often than not uh, and just stuff that we found flat out interesting. So, uh, you know, that's where we, we went and that's how we evolved through that. Um, and of course he did most of the math on that because I don't do math. <laughs> Is I'm guess when you, whenever you say you don't do math, I keep, I keep getting this mindset of, um, you ha you having to bring like a t like a big ass calculator to the table or something? <laughs> so 
Uh, a lot of the players that play with me a bunch, they've actually made jokes about it. It's become a running joke within our, <laughs> our uh, company. Um, but as they sit down to play with me the, one of the first few times, you had people who were very used to range and playing within blocks uh, of measurement. And so if they were going to make an attack, they, they knew that the amount of feet they were away mattered. The, uh, the arc trajectory. There are some people who are math monkeys when they like to come to the table. And so one of the, one of the players I had, he's, he's a huge mechanics math monkey. And so he kept asking me questions and I'm just a narrative guy. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll stick to certain mechanics, but I'm not going to make you do calculus to play my game. And so, you know, as he's asking me these questions, I said, you know what? It's five cosmic cubic centimeters away. And he said, well, how far is that? And I said, if you don't know what they are, look it up. Moving on. And so now people make fun of it a lot where it's like, well, if you're talking to Tony, you got to put it into cosmic math. So, <laughs> you know, that's just that's my viewpoint. I like to have fun. I like to tell stories. Mm -hmm. um, Scott definitely helped me out a lot with. A, I told you I was a drunk Marine, so he helped me with cleaning up my language. Um, and he helped me out with understanding mechanics a lot. So um, I think it's a lot of fun. It's And this, my, my thing with it was, as we're building this, let's not get so complicated that we selectively, you know, only put ourselves out to one person or one particular market. Let's Let's build this out so that it's, Keep it simple, stupid. Everybody can play. Everybody can have fun. Everybody can tell these stories and we can present them with formats that they can use if they just want to do a, a quick run through or mm -hmm. they don't have the time um, in their day to create a lot of this stuff. We're going to do it for you and give you something to at least jump off of a starting board for yourself and your crew um, and see what you can do from there. Uh, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where, yes, we have a lot of mechanics, a lot of mechanics that can help you do this, but we're not going to get so nitty gritty that only the sharpest minds can play. You know, this is for everybody. It's supposed to be a fun time for the whole crew and everybody can feel special throughout the whole gameplay. Yeah. Um, and since you, since you mentioned Magician... I've, I've got to address the elephant in the room because I've had a love-hate relationship with magic users and fantasy games going for the last 30 years. <laughs> how, it, how would the magic system in that work? Would it, would, it just be a, would it just be a form of exploit or would it be something a little more detailed? Uh, it's actually pretty freeform. Um, so what we've done is we we actually enjoyed how um, you know uh, D and D has split up magic into different schools. Um, even our games like you know Skyrim, Elder Scrolls has different you know schools of magic and such. So we decided to keep that going here. So you have your different skills that you can use from different schools, right? So we'll just use you know transmutation for example, right? Well, with that skill, you don't particularly know like a set number of spells it's pretty much limited to your imagination and then your ability with that skill so i mean if you wanted to uh use transmutation and turn you know that rock you know into mud all right you can go ahead and do it you know or at least try to so you just make that roll with the skill and see what happens now where it gets a little tricky at is when you want to do complicated things like let's say I want to throw a thunderstorm in this area, right? Well, <laughs> that's a little bit more difficult than just, you know, throwing a lightning bolt and hitting somebody, you know? Uh, so there's different modifiers you get thrown in there uh, that modify your roll and make it more difficult. So then you just kind of let the dice determine uh, what happens, you know? Uh, like we have with those four tiers of success, you know? Uh, you're creating this thunderstorm in this area. If you uh, hit that hard fail... You might just be hitting everybody, including your own allies. Yep. Then everybody's rolling. But the the thing with and it, and it, for people that appeal to that type of of player, you want to play a character that's big magic. You know, that's one of the things that we have so many different facets. And like he said before, that's one of our top pick tiers. 
because of a lot of the facets that we put into that and people can really grow their character from there. And if they fully fund our Kickstarter, there is an expanded universe with even more magical items and magical schools within that. And it only gets crazier from there. I guarantee you that, uh, We've even got some rune casting out there somewhere in the multiverse. And that is one of the deepest things that we've gotten into in a long time um, with people figuring out new fusions, new ways of doing it. And, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's been a wild ride, but that's that's definitely something that people have in store to look forward to um, once this puppy gets off the ground. Yeah. Um, now, when it now. When it comes to when it comes to exploits, um, mm -hmm. I look at that and since you guys mentioned um, having an early background with uh, D and D third edition, I keep coming back to um, comparing it to feats. And what I'm curious of is how similar and how different would exploits be to um, feats or even class features. Yeah, uh, I mean, the exports are very similar to them. Um, they basically allow you to modify your character a little bit more. Um, so, I mean, even you have two people who have, a, say, a high blade skill, right? Well, you might have one that he's just a little bit better because uh, some of the exploits he picks up allows him to do more damage um, or, you know, um, allows him to hit better, you know, um, mm -hmm. or he can use tactics, you know. While the other one, maybe he can just take hits more, so... He's good with blades, but at the same time, if he goes down, he might get right back up, <laughs> you know? So that's kind of what the exploits do. Some of them allow you to do things like, for instance, uh, shape-shifting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, that's a specific exploit uh, that can be picked up, and that has a whole set of, uh, you know, rules with it, um, which is a little more complicated than just, you know, hey, you get, you know, bonus of damage, <laughs> you know? So they're kind of varied in that, and especially when it comes to magic. Because uh, these exploits allow you to do different things with the magic, like um, you know, do additional damage, but at the risk of potentially damaging yourself. You know, so they do different things like that. It help modify the character and it really let you customize them more. Yeah, and when it comes to that customization, there's all there's always the risk, in my opinion, of choice paralysis, especially if. You end up doing what um, D and D third edition did with its feats and just throw them all up alphabetically like it did. Um, what have you got? What have you guys done with Heavenscape to mitigate the problem of choice paralysis? Well, one of the things that I find interesting about the way that because Scott really likes to, he's one of the most analytical, organized people I've ever met in my life. So he organizes things into categories. I think he does it while he's sleeping. I'm not sure how he does it. He raises a lot of kids, works and gets all this done. Um, but there are different categories for different exploits that you're going to be looking for. So, you know, if, if I am like, if I pick soldier and that's what I am, I am just a rough and tumble. I'm your fighter class mm -hmm. basically. Now he's got all of all of these exploits that are basically listed under that categorization. I'm a warrior type, so these are the warrior type exploits. Now I'm not locked down to that. I can get something from the magician's category or the um, science. It, it, different ones are broken into different categories, but I'm allowed to pick from each of them if I want, right? but it helps you focus in on what it is that you actually are, what it is that you're actually going for and breaks them apart into those different classes of exploits. And that kind of helps people focus in on what it is that they are and not just get stuck looking at a lot of words uh, all at once. Like you said, yeah. That choice paralysis. Um, yeah. And something else along with that, um, you know, a lot of our players are real creative. So I could throw a list of, you know, let's say 30 different exploits in front of them, and they still come up with one that's like, hey, what about this? Do you have something like this? And I'm like, you know what? I don't. But we you do know what? Now. I do now. <laughs> <laughs> we do now. Yeah, people are allowed to be inventive with this as well. Uh, as If it can be logically explained, if it can make sense, if it's not going to break the system, it's not going to 
make you OP, um, then definitely it's something that we can play with and see what can happen from it and try to tailor it down. Which I um, I can definitely I can definitely dig that. Um, now, when it comes to when it comes to something like wealth, when you guys were when you guys were testing that out, were you aiming for a more abstract version of wealth, like say, um, like say like say the wealth check that's in D twenty modern, or were you guys thinking specifically of um cur of amounts of different currencies? You know, GP, GP, all that kind of stuff. It's definitely abstract. I oh, have yeah. to answer that right off the bat because of the fact, like like we said before, this is a multiverse. So mm -hmm. the first thing that we were going to run into is like, hey, hold on a second. I created this world over here. Call it this. And you created this world over there. Now, uh, what kind of currency are y'all running off of? What's our trade rate? You know, it just wasn't going to work out that way. So it had to be abstract because, you know, my guy shows up from a different world and says, you know, I've got, I've got this many thousand rupees. And it's like, well, what are those? We don't care. We deal in uh, dung beetles. So it's it just, <laughs> it did, it had to be abstract. You're either wealthy or broke or something in between. It just, it couldn't translate uh, through that many worlds being on a, a nitty gritty scale with it. So that, uh, that's how I'm about. get so I'm guessing I'm guessing with when somebody wants to procure some sort of item or good, it would be treated as a check with the number in wealth being a um, modifier. Correct. Yeah, basically. I mean, that's how I see it. it yeah, I mean, uh, there is that we have our skill called resource skill. Mm -hmm. Essentially, it just based how resourceful your character is, uh, no matter what realm you're in. Because uh, I mean, hey, if uh, a merchant's a merchant, no matter where he is, right? Yeah, he's always <laughs> going to try to price gouge you. If he'll figure out where the money's at, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And so we have that skill set up. Now, with the actual wealth um, box on there, we have what's called a, basically a wealth die. And uh, that's, it goes between a D4 to D20. And essentially, uh, we just, uh, you know, you go and you make some purchases, and uh, everything has kind of a sort of wealth rating to it, you know, like, cloth armor you know doesn't cost as much as you know a plate mail uh so it have different dye on there for that so like a plate mail may have like a d8 and a cloth might have a d4 you know yeah. and as long as you've got that uh wealth rating there then uh, you can go ahead and uh, purchase and then you make a roll and, and then roll to see if you maintain that wealth rating yeah mm -hmm. uh funny example of that <clears throat> our first session we had uh a our resident necromancer mm -hmm. who uh, went to the uh, tavern and uh, he decided to just go and have himself a little drink. So he was, and then the local bard was there and came to his table. And so he's like, you know what? I'm tired of this guy. He keeps singing. I don't, I want him to go away. So he tossed him some coin and little did he know that he was tossing him more than he thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> And so somehow, like when he was rolling, he just really went against the odds there and lost a, a couple wealth die on that. Just trying to get this guy to go away. And so what we did was we built that into the game itself. Mm -hmm. This bard loved him so much for giving him so much coin that he followed him wherever he went. Told <laughs> all of his tales. Yeah. <laughs> went against everything he wanted to happen. But that's what's, that's what's fun about it. The dice decide. They don't let you. Uh, it's... I have seen things when since we've been doing this. Uh, I actually had a friend that he visited out here from. He's stationed out in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and so it was a one-time gig that he got to come out. And uh, I was running a game based off of an old story he and I had helped write together, and so it was really nice to have him here for that that inaugural game. But during that gameplay, he and another player character get into a PvP position, and. I couldn't have, I, I mean, it was just amazing. They were rolling these die and matching each other every single time. Fate couldn't have made this happen more acutely. It was, it was insane. So, you know, that's where I just decided is like the, the dice really do decide the story. They have their own uh, idea of what's going to happen that night. And you just got to let it happen. Yeah. And when it comes, when it comes to uh, when it comes to that, we here in the monastery have a have a um, certain mantra that we use: "The dice gods show no mercy." Amen. 
<laughs> I like that. That's good, man. Yeah, definitely. They don't because, um, and and I can I consider them I consider the dice to be a model of equality because it does not matter your ethnicity, it does not matter your gender, it does not matter where you came from, does not matter which branch you serve in, does not matter your height, weight, sex, sexual orientation, what have you. The dice gods hate you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that is true, man. Yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, I would, I would imagine that Loki invented the dice just to give to mankind to drive us insane for the rest of time. Um, well, if that's the, if that's the case, then he'd, pro- he'd probably be banned from it from as uh, he'd probably be banned from as many gambling houses as I'm banned from bars for jukebox bombing. You too, man. What, I, I you, made a new friend in this world. What you get? <laughs> what you? What you pulled jukebox bombing too? Oh yeah, man! I've been to my fair share. Uh, done my done my job. All right, just just to make sure we're on the same page, my interpretation of jukebox bombing is finding a jukebox in a bar, finding the worst song that I can on it, and then putting ten dollars on that one song so pe- so it gets played on loop for so that everybody <laughs> can be Rick rolled for the rest of the night because he's never going to give you up. He's never going to let you down. <laughs> Make you cry or desert you, and sometimes I don't get that, lucky enough to get to have that song on there. Um, but I, so I have to, I have to have backups and backups for my backups when I can't find them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. As a buddy and I back in uh, the college days. Now, of course, I didn't go to college, but I went to plenty of their parties. Uh, but we had actually made a burned CD to to take to these things. And it was one band, and I can't, I cannot honestly even remember the name of the band, but they did this song that sounded like Led Zeppelin after they breathed in a crap ton of helium. <laughs> and so we had it, but we had that one song over and over again burned onto the CD. About four songs in, we'd put in a random song, like something from Metallica or something of that nature just to give people hope that it was over, but it wasn't, it was not over. Cause right after that, there was five more of this one song. So uh, that's, that's one of my favorite things to do is just to help mm-hmm. people remember you're not in control of your night and how fun it's going to be. Yeah. And I am, I'm the GM. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When it comes now, when it comes to advancement, um, given the mm-hmm. given the whole favor and CP, I'm guessing that adva- that advancement is not is based on more of a currency like approach instead of being level based. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah, actually, right on. Um, and in definitely, that, and in, you can get people who save it up better and who do it better, uh, spend it more wisely. They do spend it more wisely. We got one girl that r- runs in our crew. That's just a genius of this stuff. I mean, I think she might understand it better than we do at this point. Yeah. Honestly. Um, well, when it, co- when, when it comes to, when it comes to advan- advancement, so I can see that with, with um, character points, and I'm guessing favor is the social end of that. Like, it's, it's not going to give you any new um, exploits or, or skills or anything like that, but it might get you services. Uh, well, favor, we use favor as uh, other games call, like, uh, you know, Benny's or Inspiration or whatever you mm-hmm. want to call it. It's basically what we use to, uh, you know, help out with those rolls that don't go the way you want them to. <laughs> yeah. You might have you know? a chance to re-roll or you might have a chance to modify your role. And a lot of times the favor can either come out of actually playing your character. Well, uh, it can come out of it. Act, I, we've actually given them out for um, just epic failures too. Uh, well, you, you sucked at that, but Hey, you know what? You earned a favor. So you don't have to suck so bad next time. Um, so th- that's where the favors come in handy. They can help you out if you have a, a complete critical fail um, and you just want to re-roll that. Well, if you've got a favor in your pocket, then you can toss it over and we'll use that. 
So that's kind of how that works. Yeah, it can also be used to modify that it rolls a little bit to uh, help, you know, make it easier for you to accomplish a task. Of course, it's very limited in, uh, you know, its currency. You don't get it very often, so you have to spend it wisely. Unless you're like some players who just just mad pocket those things. Like we, <laughs> we started a game with one girl. She was the same girl, Mechanic Monkey, but she was uh, – carrying a character over and she already had like six of these things saved up and she wouldn't let them go if you actually paid her real money to let them go you know she she was like well i might i might need that in the future we need it right now oh no 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 it could get worse <laughs> you know so and the same thing with the character points um you know she did the same thing with those the character points have been used to basically increase uh, your skills um your attributes or even pick up new exploits for your character uh, you know, everything kind of has a little price tag on it. And uh, deal, yeah. you get so many points uh, during the session just based upon what's going on. Uh, when you hit milestones, you get some points as well, showing growth of your character. And um, you know, how you spend them, I mean, that, that's really up to you. Yeah, because different things come with different price tags, uh, skills, attributes, uh, exploits. So one guy might just be sitting there going, well, I'm just going to max out this skill could work for them, might not. Uh, or, you know, you have some people who are like, well, I'm going to pick up every exploit I can find so that I'm uh, I'm really multifaceted. You know, well, good luck with that. I'd like to see how it works out when you have all low skills. So it's, it's really a balancing act on how you build your character sheet, and that's a lot of the game. Yeah. Um, when it comes... Now, when it comes to... When it comes to the when it comes to that more freeform nature, one thing I'm curious about is: does origin play a role in what's in what skills might be um, more or less expensive, and not just skills, exploits as well? Um, it it does not. Uh, what it does is it gives you some bonus uh, exploits at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which you get to choose some for your character, but you also get some bonus ones from it. You know, and then also gives you bonus, uh, basically skill points, but it's in a specific category. Like with the soldier, it was, you know, weapons, basically. So you mm -hmm. pick a weapon that you're more specialized in. And so you get those free points in there, so you don't have to spend your starting points on that skill, you know. So it kind of allows you to be more flexible with those. As it well. allows you to start out at a different rate, but at the same time, as you play through the game, as you're building your character it's going to be just as expensive for you to do something as it is for the other guy. So just like the dice see no color, they see no gender, they see no preference. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're building these characters out after cre character creation night, good luck, man, because you're going to be seeing the same as everybody else at the table. The magician's not going to automatically rule the table. The warrior class is not going to automatically be unkillable. That's this was built with that in mind. Where because we've played a few games where we got the rule books, we broke them down, and then it come to find out the two people that picked warrior class were just unkillable monsters throughout the whole game, and everybody else was just kind of picking and choosing who they were going to suck up to so they didn't die during the gameplay. You know, and that was where we were like, wait a second, we don't want that to happen. We don't want a broken class. We want everybody trying to struggle to succeed at the same time, just with different flavor um, on each and everything and how they do things, how they represent themselves and play the character. Uh, so that's what this was really inspired to do was to, you know, as you earn these CPs, these character points, you've really got to think about how you're going to use them because there's not after character creation night, nothing's there to help you. You've got to figure out how to build that character the best way it's going to serve you. Mm -hmm. And to the, to that end, now since this is going for a free form with a lot of these different choices, and this is why I brought up the whole choice paralysis thing, has has there been instances where somebody um wasn't quite was um was concerned that a a um decision on character point spending now might screw them over down the road? Oh yeah, oh <laughs> yeah. yeah. You get people who yeah. want to change it. Like they they turn in their sheet at the end of the night, you know. And we like to get people to use their points, you know. Like go ahead, 
use your points right now. That's kind of what's happening at this moment. You had some downtime. This is what you're doing. You know, not in the middle of a fight when you realize something else could have helped you out better. And you say, wait, can I go back and take that back? You know, it's so a lot of the the point spinning and, and stuff like that, it, it gets to the point where people are, we have a binder that we can pass around or people can also have our PDF that are, that are accessed into our OneDrive. So a lot of people will sit there at the end of the night just studying, you know, thinking about how they're going to do this because what seems like a good idea at this moment, because you just encountered something that it would have come in handy for may not matter next week when something all new is about to threaten your life or your character's life or whatever. Um, it's funny to watch people go yeah. through it. It is, and uh, what we've noticed is that uh, quite a few of our players pick up uh, what you call like a utility skill, uh, something that can be used, uh, you know, in most circumstances, not all. It's a very versatile skill, and they're very comfortable with that uh, because they know that when they come against the unknown, at least they have this they can rely on uh, most of the time. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. And then they have these other skills that are kind of like, well, these are just backups, you know, just in case I need to use them, you know. <laughs> you, you, you find that a lot of people don't even rely on some of their more powerful skills. They use some of the trickier skills that they can, or exploits, I'm sorry, that they can pick up. Um, because like he said, it's, it's something that goes across the board. Any situation they come into, it's just, well, maybe it's, it has to do with an advantage on a role or it has to do with the ability to succeed, but you lose something along the way. Um, but it could be something varied from just opening a door. Because you'd be surprised how many people you can say there's a door in front of you and they're like, well, I'm going to punch the door. Well, good luck, man. And they're sitting there rolling strength for something that has a doorknob. You know, they could have just opened it, you know. <laughs> But it's amazing what you see players do, and I just let them roll with it. You know, like if they didn't ask me if there's a digital pad to open it, well, good luck, man. Uh, punch this uh, six foot door down, or six inch thick steel door down. You know, and um, so a lot of times that's he's right. I see them picking up skills where they can maybe increase their perception or uh, have an advantage instead of just a straight power skill. Mm -hmm. And when it comes now, I know I um when it comes to the when it comes to the full when it comes to the full book, given given the um concepts that you guys are that you guys are working with with the whole multiverse, I'm curious if you've got a section in mind that discusses um you that discusses creation of worlds in and of itself. uh i would say it hints at it yeah mm. heavily um this being the first thing that we're releasing you know obviously we definitely want to get people's palettes uh we want to give people a taste and we want people to be interested in getting more um you know because we're not dumb but at the same time it is it is definitely you're going to get a taste you're going to see a little peek behind the veil i think uh, and then and the way this works. Yeah, you will. Cause, um, even with the exordia, um, it's connected to the other realms. So, uh, there's little plants kind of already in there in the, in the lore and such that be present in it that, uh, mm -hmm. when these other realms show up, you're like, wait, 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 wait. I know that name. Like that was that's present cool. over here. Like, how is that connected? Oh, definitely. And then you get to learn a little bit more. And so that's what we've done. We've basically done these uh, plants and we even have characters who have traveled across the different realms and have made their uh, their basic impact on each of the realms in a way with the lore. Definitely. And, and of course, we've got our podcast out there that people can always listen to to learn more about it and the way that it functions and the way that our stories function. Um, and they can find out a lot of useful information just from tuning in to that. Uh, I mean, it's open across the board. I think we got it on every single a Podbean, iTunes, Google Play, all that stuff. I can't ever remember all the names of stuff. <laughs> Uh, but it's out there to listen to because it it's been going. We're we're coming up on a year over I think. a year now. Yeah, almost over, over a year, a little over a year. So there has been a lot of wild information and great storytelling that's come out of it. And Exordia is one 
it's one focal point that we decided to go with to introduce this to people to help them build um, worlds and to really spice up their own palettes. And then after that, yeah, we've got some different, uh, we've got some different worlds and not all of them based in high fantasy. You might mm -hmm. have some that are steampunk, some that are cyberpunk, uh, future apocalyptic, uh, you know, time travelers we've dealt with, you know, so it's, there's a lot to be had and there's a lot to do with it. And it's like you mentioned before, it's creation. Uh, I, I think that we're, we're mainly focused on creativity based fun yeah. so that even if somebody's coming into this with their own idea, well, we're just giving you a taste, man. We're helping you out uh, as far as that's concerned, but we'd really like to see what people can do for themselves as well, what they can come up with, what they what they can be when they let their imaginations go wild. And that's even a part of our Kickstarter. We are offering to people and well, it's a one-time opportunity. Uh, once we reach, meet a certain goal that we're going to help them create their own heavenscape character mm -hmm. and have it influence the world of heavenscape or the worlds, I guess, rather. <laughs> it's that um, nice save there. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> oh. I was gonna I was gonna call it a saving throw, but that might be a little too obvious. <laughs> <laughs> but how how many pages do you th do you think you'd be shooting for? Like 130? Oh, well, I believe our estimation is about. About a hundred, yeah, about a hundred, between a hundred and a hundred and twenty-five, roughly. Yeah, with um, with artwork and yeah, artwork, full bindings and everything, you're looking at probably getting a full manual, a uh, hundred to hundred twenty-five. Now, each additional add-on type world or or something of that nature won't be as big as the initial rule book, uh, because this is going to really solidly plant itself in what the core functionality is. Mm -hmm. Then after that, we'd be looking at doing just add on books. Uh, for yeah, additional supplements. information, supplemental. Right, information. right. You know, we won't have to uh, basically re um, reteach you to the, the system and how it works and everything. It would just be additional material that you can add into the pre existing system if you choose to. Right. Yeah. I, I can definitely get I can definitely get behind that. Um and I'll be and overall I'll be keeping a I'll be keeping a close eye on how on how it develops and and what and what sort of craziness ha happens wh whether it be with with both um Heavenscape and with the um podcast. Um <laughs> well, that's what we appreciate about you. <laughs> um but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you guys for coming all the way to to the temple, and I would say braving the hell that is time zones, but we're in the same time zone, so. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for having us. It's been a holy experience. Yep. Yeah, and of course, and, and of course, anytime you guys see fit to return, or if you or if you see fit to drag me all the way over there, um, the door is always open. As I often say, drinking is not mandatory, but it is imper but it but it is encouraged. Strongly encouraged, yes, sir. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay. Fucking frosty, everybody. <laughs>